Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're taking a look at Haunted Almanac. This is an anthology put out of the Highland Paranormal Society's work over the last couple years. Now that society is essentially just Nate Treem. This book is published by Games Omnivorous, which is a really interesting uh, publishing company over in Portugal that puts out OSR and just fantasy RPG related stuff. And this is basically full of tons of little adventures, little bite-sized pieces of RPGs, uh, little systems, one-page dungeons, things like that. Over the last couple of years, I've actually received quite a few of these little pieces. We have like the Moldy Unicorn. It's a short little location here. The Eternal Caverns of Urk, a little underground adventure, stuff like this. But there's really no good way for me to review each of these individually. So I was really happy to see them all compiled into one book, which makes for a better review. Before we dig into the contents, though, a quick shout out to today's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Into the AM and their series of fantasy and sci-fi themed t-shirts. They've been a big long-term supporter of the channel, and I am a big fan of their shirts. In particular, these new designs they've been putting out with this minimalist sci-fi look looks a lot like the sort of thing you would see in Alien or in a Mothership campaign, that kind of old school 3D graphics. As we're getting into colder weather, they also have uh, some new hoodies and joggers that you can pick up on their site. Use a link in the description below to get 10% off their entire web store. Thanks again to Into the AM for sponsoring. Now let's get back to the show. All right, let's dig into Haunted Almanac and see what we get inside here. It's done in this really nice hardcover format. I love how all of the edges of the papers are done in black. So you have this sort of these black edges here. That's very cool looking. Um, it's all stitch bound on the inside. It feels very sturdy. And even just from flipping through it quickly, you can see that there is just lots of different designs and different layouts being used here. So it reminds me of the Knock magazine in some ways as a result, but it's all done by one person. So it's broken up here into a couple different sections. We have the Tunnel Goons, which is a system that uh, Nate designed. We have Pearl, which is another system. In the light of a Ghost Star, that is a separate a uh, little system slash adventure, which I actually reviewed previously in one of my big zine reviews. A bunch of one page games, some micro settings, and a number of adventures here. Now, in terms of OSR compatibility, it varies a lot. Some of these adventures are for one of his minimalistic systems. Some of them are more OSR compatible in the sense that they have OSR stats. Uh, so that's really gonna depend on the adventure. However, uh, most of them can be pretty easily converted to something OSR-like if that's what you wanted to do. First of all, we have Tunnel Goons, which has seen some popularity online. I've seen a number of people making hacks of this or little adventures for it. Uh, we just have the rules here. They're very quick and easy. Reminds me a lot of uh, my game Maze Rats in some ways, in the sense that there's uh, just 2d6 that you're rolling for most of your actions. You have three basic uh, ability scores that roughly correspond to strength, dexterity, and willpower. And the, the twist here is that instead of always trying to get uh, 10, which is what Maze Rats has, there's a variable difficulty scores here. And then if you're fighting a bad guy, if you roll over that difficulty score, the difference is how much damage you do. And if you roll under it, then the difference is how much damage they do to you. And uh, as you deal damage to, to that monster, its difficulty score actually goes down by that amount. So there's a death spiral element here. As you start beating up monsters, they get weaker and easier to fight. But if a monster starts out very strong, like a dragon with a difficulty of 12 or 13, it's gonna be very hard to hurt them in the first place, requiring some creative thinking. I really like the character tables over here where you figure out what your character is going to start out as by rolling on each of these tables. So you have their childhood, their profession, and then during the war. And each of these gives you a bonus to one of those three abilities and it gives you a piece of equipment. Now there's not a ton of variety here, but this is a very light minimalist system. So I think you could easily hack it or expand it if that's what you wanted to do. Here we have the Moldy Unicorn. Uh, we've seen this little pamphlet, I showed you that earlier, and it's been reformatted here to fit onto a two-page spread, which is really quite nice. This isn't so much an adventure as it is just a short little location that you could drop either onto the side of the road or in the middle of one of your fantasy cities or something like that. Uh, there's a couple main rooms here that you can explore, a couple secret rooms that you can find if you are clever enough, and a whole bunch of encounters here that you could roll perhaps every time that they visit the Moldy Unicorn just to make things a little bit more interesting. All the stats here are done for um, tunnel goons. So for example, random encounters could be a human prince, throws a raucous bachelor party, or no one yet realizes that the current batch of wine was made with hallucinogenic mushrooms. Things can change every time. We have things like a little crypt here. Again, this is a dungeon, but it's not really a dungeon adventure. I would more put this as a kind of just mini location to explore. There's a bunch of little dungeons like this spread out through this book. 
And I think that their best use is just to drop them around, sprinkle them around your campaign setting, perhaps have rumors to them, so that players on um, in the middle of a bigger campaign can take a little sidetrack, visit this little dungeon, explore what's there. There's a couple little riddles and problems to solve, and then get back out again. This one in particular has a nice little puzzle to solve, where to get through this secret door, there's a family tree that you have to fill in. And you can figure out how that family tree should be filled in by examining these statues that are scattered around, all of which have clues that tell you how they are related to one another. And then by writing all those clues down, you can piece together how the whole family tree works. I thought that was very clever. I haven't seen a puzzle like that before. Quite nice. Here's the Eternal Caverns of Urk. I'm not going to show uh, every single two-page spread throughout this whole book. There's just a lot of material. I'm kind of focused on the stuff they found most interesting. Uh, this is a kind of an underground generator. You can generate the flora, the water, the atmosphere, the peoples that are down there, things that are living there. So if the players wander into just a random tunnel or mine complex, you can use this to generate weird stuff that is there. Now, uh, most of the stuff for tunnel goons is not uh, gold for XP. So you're not going to be getting um, a lot of treasure in most of these adventures. So if you're going to run it more OSR style, you'll probably have to add your own treasure in order to increase the incentives to go down there. Virtually every room inside these dungeons has something going on in it. Uh, for example, you've got an eternal dinner party over here. Um, in this one, there is a scene of ghosts gorging themselves on an opulent spectral feast. And the whole scene repeats over and over again. If the PC partakes in the phantom food, it will be the most satisfying meal of their life. And they will begin to take on a pig-like appearance as they eat. So it reminds me a bit of uh, movies like Spirited Away. These pig-like features will only fade after a couple of weeks of strict dieting and will start to return anytime they overeat. This condition is permanent. I really like that there's these little fantasy or fairy tale-like elements sprinkled through this. It has a kind of a childlike whimsy to a lot of the adventures in here. That's often the attitude that we have. We have little dungeons like the Forgotten Shrine of the Slime Toad. Nice little looping structure here, lots of different ways that you can explore. Each of the rooms has short little descriptions. For example, um, four albino toad wraiths prepare meals of frog, frogs and large flies on four silver platters. They pour green slime from the idol in room six over each platter. They feed these platters to the toad behemoth in room five. There's something going on in most of those places. Plenty of people to interact with. And even when there's no one to talk, there is um, descriptions that are vivid, that are short, that are going to paint a picture and give players something to mess around with. Due to how short most of these little dungeons are, they're often fairly linear, but that's not a terrible crime when something is so small and you're just using it as little mini dungeons to scatter around. Next we have Prol, which is a short coin flipping analog adventure game is what it's called. Another short little rule set. Best to look at the character sheet here. You just have these six different attributes, which are just shown with pictures. You can interpret them how you like, and you fill them in as you level up. Uh, the more points you have in one of these attributes, the more coins you flip, and you're looking to try and get at least one heads. Um, I might want to roll this uh, with dice instead of with coins. I just find that a little bit easier, but it's basically the same idea. There's some fun little miniature world building stuff here. Like we have different religions you can pick, like uh, the Church of the Gears or the Church of Verdant or the Holy Wheel of Evolution. Um, we have different backgrounds, like a plague refugee, a tea brewer, or a busker. And Prol comes with this great little adventure, the Pilgrims of the Knighted Path, which is actually a modern day Halloween adventure. So you play a bunch of kids traveling around on Halloween night. Instead of trying to collect gold for XP, you're trying to collect as much candy as possible. I love this idea. It's a lot of fun. It comes with a hex crawl right here. There's no rules exactly for hex crawling, for moving from, from one hex to another. But that's pretty easily resolved. You could just say that every time you move one hex, you roll a random encounter. And there's some random encounters further on here. And then you can read the description of the place if there's one there already there. Each of these different uh, cities here comes with a particular house with a description of the person that's there that you can talk to, how much candy they have. Sometimes they have little missions that they give to the kids. It's great. I really love it. We have neighborhood encounters like a child dressed as a mummy or a human skull lying in the middle of the street or a deputy Mike, local idiot with a badge or three flaming jack-o'-lanterns come rolling down the street at high speed. Locations in the wilderness between towns often have their own special descriptions, and we also have encounters for the wilderness as well, like a pillowcase with 20 pieces of candy in it, or a shadow figure moves out of the corner of your eye. Nothing there if the PCs try to look at it directly. Great stuff. You can add more horror elements and actual monsters if you want to, or I suppose you could keep it more realistic. We have a number of miniature one-page rule sets, we have a fantasy one. We have one where you play different kinds of robots. Brim and Feather, which is more like a LARP. We have Mecha Dudes. All of these would have to be expanded into something larger if you were really going to play it. But they give you a sense of different ways that you can build your own rule set. Neanderthals. 
Nozer, I guess that'd be like new OSR, all handwritten. Yegs, an OSR game about making money. We even have gems like Sequencer, which isn't even a role-playing game. It's basically just a board game. Next, we have some micro settings, and a lot of these are quite charming. Things like East of East. I love the quote that this starts with. Tell me what you want done, and I will try it. If I have to walk from here to the East of East and fight the wild wereworms in the last desert. That's something that Bilbo in The Hobbit actually says. I completely forgot about that. A little piece of world building there. So you start over here, and you have to make your way all the way to East of East through this little hex crawl. And a lot of the locations uh, that are numbered here have a write-up with different NPCs that you can meet, but there's plenty of random encounters for all the different terrain types as you venture across this. This could work as not necessarily a one-shot, probably a two or three shot as you make your way across this fantasy landscape. We have a lost isle that you can explore, full of rumors and different types of uh, creatures to encounter like jelly folk, blue newts, veggie folk. We've got random encounters. This one, for example, is all OSR statted. So you can run it with old school essentials or really any old D and D game. One thing that's a little bit odd is that the map of the Island is at the back of this adventure, when I think it would be much better to have it near the front. It's all the way back here. Um, so there is a number of locations here, like nine or 10, nope, up to 13 different locations to explore. It's not a hex crawl. You can just travel directly from location to location and roll random encounters along the way to see what's uh, on the roads. There's the Doomlands, which is very Mad Maxian. It has a, uh, not a hex crawl, but a square crawl that you can move through. Each of the different terrain types, of course, has its own random encounter table. There are uh, information about the different terrains and the different denizens. This one does not really have stats. Some of them are statless, and you would have to import that on your own. The Stolen City is a bit of a city generator. It's a city that's been taken over by Ratmen, or Skaven, if you will. And as you wander around, you can roll to see what the city is like. So for example, we have uh, Alien Ruin encounters. We have build a block. So what's on this block? We roll a D6 two times. You might get a tenement building that is burned or a house that's also a mansion or a specialty business, perhaps a bathhouse or a blacksmith. So there's gonna be different things on each block as you travel around. There is a map that you can fill in as you go. It's quite large. I don't know if you're gonna wanna fill in every single thing for all of those blocks. I might go with more of a six by six or an eight by eight size map just so that it's a little bit more manageable but there's plenty of information here that you can use to fill that encounters along the roads as you go uh, different traffic drugs gangs and uh, fashion trends near the back we have a section just called nate's adventures uh, not totally sure why these are separated from the rest a lot of them are written for systems like uh, tunnel goons so they could be in the tunnel goon section uh, but nevertheless there is a variety of one and two page dungeons uh, some short adventures beneath the mausoleum uh, there's a quick little dungeon adventure you can go through. Again, fairly straightforward. It's, it's pretty linear, but a lot of these rooms are fun and they could easily be yanked out and dropped into other dungeons if you wanted some more variety. Other adventures include things like the Barrow of the Elf King, which has, looks like OSR stats, Cursed Chapel of the Sludge Mother, the Death Chenwick Gas Station, I think is how you say it. Some of the typing uh, type fonts are a little bit hard to read. Black Fever Mountain, you're lured up this mountain with the promise of golden treasure, but the villagers are just sending you to your death because this is a uh, little chapel for a, not a basilisk, a manticore, this horrible beast that is extremely difficult to kill and will probably take you out if you're not very careful. We have the Lair of the Sand Mage, plenty of strange items here for players to mess around with and discover what they do, hopefully not get too badly cursed by their effects. The Temple of the Bat Serpent with this fun, very old school, it looks like a old video game where all of the dungeon maps were created with keyboard characters. I forget exactly what that's called, but it has that look to it. We have the Mephistic Laboratory of the Pescomancer. The laboratory includes fun rooms like the Almost Fish Pond. A murky pond in the floor contains 3D4 Almost Fish. Two fishlings sprinkle fish food into the pond. So some almost, almost fish might include things like yellow stingrays with clumps of human-like fingers on its back, or a tumorous catfish with human ears, or a cyclops bass with two reptilian legs. The primeval holt of the Elk Lord, if you want an outdoor adventure to explore. The Thessalic Ziggurat of the Lost Prince. The Tomb of the Swine Prophet. Plenty of random encounters in this one. Things like large orange snails grazing on moss, floor slippery with snail slime or a pirate rat plays an accordion while another dances. And this is a very Christmassy adventure. What child is this? There is an incarnated God baby and you got to take care of him. 
If you keep him um, well fed and happy, then you get all sorts of bonuses. Like you heal D4 extra hit points every sunrise, you get double XP from fiend type creatures, and so on. You're traveling with him across the country. That's a lot of fun. I might actually play this for Christmas. At the back, we have an appendix including things like D6 unwanted magical companions, perhaps a black dog only you can see waiting to lap up your blood when you die. Hmm, that's fun. Or a tall, pale man in a gray suit is seen standing behind you every time you look in a mirror. He never talks, just stares hungrily. A humorous little monster maker. And spells of the inverted mountain. For example, Life Taker. Spell is cast on a baby three months old or less. Next time the caster sleeps, their mind is permanently switched with the babies. Have fun adventuring as a three-month-old. And there we go. So that is the compilation Haunted Almanac by Nate Treem. As usual, I will put links in the description below where you can pick this up for yourself if it looks like your kind of RPG book. And thanks for watching. See you guys next time.